Hello, and thank you for joining me and Jerry on this day for our midweek Bible study. We're continuing on in our study of the Gospel of John, chapter 6. So I encourage you, if you haven't got your Bible with you, to go get your Bible at this time. Those of you who already have it with you, open up to John, chapter 6. And as we prepare ourselves, let's give ourselves in this time to God. So let's pray. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, once again, we come into your presence. And thank you, not only for the gift of your Son and the gift of your Holy Spirit, but also now for the gift of your living Holy Word. Speak to us now, dear God, through the power of your Son and through the power of your Spirit, giving us something new from this great old story, this gospel account of the life of Jesus. Speak to us and instill in us, dear God, a desire to want to know more, and to continue to focus upon you, not making it about ourselves. So once again now, bless this time of study. Lead us and guide us as only you and you alone can do. And we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As you know, like I said, we're looking at John chapter 6. And in this chapter so far, we've already looked at the feeding of the 5,000, which actually would have been over 10,000. That happened on one day. And then on that night, following the feeding of the 10,000, we talked about how Jesus walked on the water. Well, I want to pick up now starting with verse 22 of chapter 6. First off, looking at verses 22 through 24 as we look at what continues on the next day. So follow along with me in verse 22. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there. They also saw that Jesus had not gotten into the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. Now, in these opening verses, we read how the crowd, they're looking for Jesus. They can't find him, but worse, it's like they can't figure out where he could have possibly gone. All they know are two things. First off, that Jesus didn't get into the boat with the disciples. And secondly, they know this because they saw them leave without Jesus. They left alone. And even though they did not know where he had gone, they were still determined to find him. So they end up, they get into their own boats, and they head in, in the direction of the nearest city. Now, even though I could have just easily skipped these opening verses here, in the same way that the books, the books I'm using, they basically didn't say anything about it. I wanted to share this with you because as I was reading it, three questions popped into my head, came into my heart. The first question is this. What would happen in our lives if we searched diligently for Jesus in the same way that these people did? What would happen? Secondly, what is it that's happening today? What's going on today that's stopping people? What's going on today that's stopping you and me from searching for Jesus in this way? But the biggest question that came to my mind and my heart was this. What do I need to change? What do we need to change in our lives today that will help us to seek Jesus out, not just once, but to seek him out every day of our lives? I just, I love these questions because they are personal. And they're questions we need to look at in our lives, especially in what, everything that's going on. So what do we need to change in our lives that helps us to seek Jesus out the same way this crowd did? Well, when you continue on in all this, you come to verses then 25 to 34. And in thinking about the answer to these personal questions, we now come to one of the longest and probably hardest passages found in John's gospel. It contains some of the most beautiful, also some of the most powerful words of Jesus. But to truly understand them, you have to stop and do a little digging in them. So, here in these opening words, the opening words to this long passage that continues through chapter 6, let's begin looking at verse 25. 
When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his zeal, his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. So now as we get to verse 25 of all this, we see the crowds, they find Jesus, and they immediately, they've got just one question for him. How did you get here? Where did you come from? How did, how did you get here, especially before us? But now, to this question, Jesus doesn't give them a reply. Instead, he picks up there in verse 26, and what he does say to them is this, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. What is Jesus actually telling them? What's he really saying to them at this point? Well, what he's saying is this, is that you have seen something wonderful. You got to see God's grace at work in your lives. But instead of focusing on God who did this for you, all you can think about is the bread that I used to feed you with. Or in other words, you can't think about your souls by thinking about your stomachs. More worried about your stomach than you are your soul. You see, Jesus knew. He knew it was their desire for earthly bread that drove them to come across the sea and go to all this trouble to find him. But then Jesus continues on in verse 27. Because here in this verse, Jesus now begins to challenge them. He's challenging them to look for a different kind of bread in a different kind of way. He says to them, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. You see, he's saying to seek the bread that can do more than just fill their stomachs. But instead, look for the bread that can now give them eternal life. But to do this, they're going to have to do something specific, okay? The thing they got to do is this. They have to stop trying to work for it. They have to stop working for it. They have to stop trusting in that bread, the bread of this world, the food of this world that perishes, the food that cannot, does not give true life. You see, what Jesus is trying to do is to take their thoughts away from the bread that he had given to them just the day before. And what he wants them to understand is that there are greater hungers. There are greater hungers in our lives that only he can satisfy for them, for us. There is, first off, the hunger for truth. You see, it is in Jesus that the truth of God can be found. There's the hunger for life. A life that is more abundant than this earthly life they are now living. There's a hunger for love. You see, in Jesus, there is the love that can not just overcome our sins, but also overcome the power of death. But also there is the hunger of the heart. There is the hunger of the soul. And then, in trying to continue on with this, Jesus then seeks. He seeks to drive all this home by pointing out something very specific about himself. There in the last part of verse 27. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Now why is this reference 
made by Jesus himself so important. We see, back in this time, it wasn't a person's signature, your John Hancock, okay? It wasn't a person's signature that was important, really. It's not what made something genuine or authentic, okay? What it was was a personal seal, okay, of someone using their own personal signet ring. Nobody had a ring like this, okay? You had your own signet ring, and you've seen the old movies. You've seen this blob of wax put over whatever it is you're sealing up, and then they take the signet ring, and they mark it. They mark it not just as sealed, but most importantly, they're marking it that what is in here is true. That this is truthful. What you're going, what, what you know you're receiving, because my seal is on this, you are receiving truthfully what I am sending to you. Jesus, I believe he chose this. Because when it came to God, for the Jewish leaders, the Jewish rabbis, God has a seal. And God's seal is truth. It's the word truth. Now for the Jewish rabbis, the Jewish religious leaders, they had a word for this truth, God's truth. That word is ameth, okay? Now, the great thing about the word ameth is the way that it's spelled, okay? It is actually spelled using just three letters. It is spelled using the first, the middle, and the last letters of the Jewish alphabet. The words aleph, mem, and tau, okay? And when using just the first, middle, and last letters of the Jewish alphabet, it means this, that the truth of God, the truth of God is the beginning, the middle, and the end of all life. And that's what Jesus is telling them, okay? That he can satisfy the eternal hunger that is within them because he, he's, he's not just been sealed by God. You see, the truth is, he is God's personal seal. He is God's personal seal of truth. But after he says all this, then we get to verse 28. And in verse 28, we hear the response of the crowd. In response to all this, the crowd then asked Jesus another question. And they ask is, what must we do to perform the works, the works of God? You see, as Jesus was telling them all this, it appears that the crowd immediately began to think about all this in terms of what was known as good works back in that time. You see, it's most likely that in their minds, they went here because of the belief back in this time that it was possible to have a good life by doing good works. And in return for doing good works, then God would give you a good life. You would find favor with God. Back in this time, people could be divided into three categories or three classes. There was first off the category, the class that people were good. There were people who were good. They always did good. There was a second group known as those who were bad. They couldn't do anything good. But the big thing was there were those who were in the group called in between. And those who were in between, if they could just do one extra good work, then they could be moved up. They could then be moved up into the class with the good people, okay? But the thing is, this, is not, this has nothing to do with what Jesus is talking about. There in verse 29, then the answer that Jesus gives is not the answer they were expecting. He lets them know that there is no list of works. And by the way, did you notice that works here in their question is plural? Jesus wants them to know that, that instead there is only one work and one work only. And then Jesus gives them an answer that's both direct and simple. There in verse 29, that you believe in him whom he has sent. That you believe in him, Jesus, whom he, God, has sent. You see what Jesus is telling them and us is that this day, that the only work that is required is to place your trust, place your trust 
and your trust alone in both him and in God. For this is the work that will lead you to the true bread that will give eternal life. We then finish it up with verses 30 to 34. Here we read then that Jesus has now made this great statement of truth about himself. That there is only one work that needs to be done in a person's life, and that is to believe, to trust in him. And in response to this, the crowd, they do something very human. They then, they ask for a sign. They ask Jesus to, for proof, to prove himself that all this is true. Now, it's at this point that we ourselves, we want to judge these people, don't we? We want to say or ask, how dare they ask Jesus to prove himself? But you see, the truth is, we're the ones with the problem at this point. We have the problem with them doing this because, you see, we already know the rest of the story. But making such a demand as a sign was something that had always been a part of the history of the Jewish people, especially when it comes to the story of their ancestors' journey through the wilderness. And especially true, this was especially true, with the giving of the manna the people. You see that giving of the manna, the manna had always been regarded as the bread of God. And there was a strong belief among the Jewish religious leaders that when the Messiah came to them, that he would again give to them this bread of God. But not only this, also that when the Messiah gave this manna to the people, his manna would far surpassed the manna that Moses had given to the people. You see, it was to be an act that would far exceed the signs of Moses, which was actually considered, you know, this giving of the manna, it was considered to actually be Moses' greatest work. So in their minds, to ask for a sign would prove to them that Jesus was the Messiah. Because after all, since God had proven Moses' leadership, through the giving of the manna, wouldn't God then validate the coming of the Messiah through an even greater work of giving manna that far succeeds that which Moses had given to their ancestors? The thing is this, if you remember, Jesus has already done this. Remember in the feeding of the over 10,000 in comparison to the giving of the manna. The manna that was given to the ancestors there in the wilderness, remember, it met their needs each day, but there was nothing left over. All they had, they were satisfied for each day. In the giving of the food, feeding the over 10,000, not only do they have enough to eat where they are more than satisfied, then there's an abundance of it left over. There were 12 baskets left over, but once again, they still failed to see all this. So Jesus did in verse 32, he begins in this verse then by giving them a three-part answer to their request. First off, he reminds them of something very important. Some would say they had forgotten. I think they just choose to not pay attention to it. They choose to forget it. And that's simply this. Jesus reminds them it wasn't Moses who gave them the bread. It was God. You see, they got it in their head. Moses did it, but he didn't. God gave it to them. Second. Jesus then clarifies the true difference between the bread offered through Moses and the bread offered by God. That while the manna that God gave the people through Moses, definitely it definitely met their needs at that moment to take away their physical hunger. Because, see, that's the only thing regular bread can do. The bread was still, though, not the true bread of God because the true bread of God is the one that can give life to its fullest. And then third, the third thing he reminds them is that the manna given by Moses through God was only a symbol. It was only a symbol of the true bread of God that it was still to come. And then in verse 35, that's when Jesus reveals to them that he is the sign that they have been waiting for because he is the true bread of God from heaven. And that's where we'll pick up next week. Well, so we'll pick up looking at verses 35 and how Jesus continues to show them, show us how he is the true bread of heaven. As we finish up our time, let us now go into a moment of prayer. And I invite you, if you will, to please just 
bow your heads at this time and join me as first off together let's pray as one for all the people who are sick those that are sick and hurting not just sick from the coronavirus from everything else flu and other diseases let's pray for those that are sick at this time Let us also now pray for those families that have lost loved ones through all this hardship, this difficulty, then to go and have to lose a family member, a friend. Let's pray for those who have lost loved ones. And now would you please join me as we pray for all the medical personnel, doctors, nurses, first responders, Let's pray for them, pray for their families. And let's also continue to pray for the men and women of our fire and police departments, the men and women, women of our armed forces and all their families as well as they continue to go out doing their job, putting their lives in danger. So let's pray for them as well. Let's also continue to pray for our nation that we will not seek political parties but we'll seek God out that we can be one nation under him again let's pray for our president all the elected officials in both our nation and in our state and in our community here and now let's pray for our church and once again, we'll remember that the church is not a building, that it is us. And we can still reach out and minister and touch and bless lives for the, the glory of God and the glory of his son. So let's pray for us as a church and our future as a church. And last but not least, let's pray for ourselves. Ask God to reveal himself to us and to this nation. Let's ask God to just strengthen us and bless us and keep us safe. And also to give us, to give us the wisdom and understanding that we need to make it through this by trusting in him. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this time of study and also for this time of prayer. Continue to bless now as only you and you alone can do. Continue to lead us and guide us, dear God. Forgive us for our sins, for our times that we have failed you. Forgive us for our, our selfishness, for the times that we have taken more than we needed, not leaving anything behind for somebody else. Help us, dear God, just to be Christ now be Christ in everything that we do and to keep our eyes focused upon you and the cross of our Lord and Savior. So once again, bless us now, lead us and guide us as we continue to place ourselves into your loving, life-giving hands. And once again, we ask this in your holy, mighty, and very precious name. Amen. Thank you again for being here with us. Take care. God bless and hope to see you this Sunday. Goodbye.